Um, welcome everyone to the second to last installment of Explorations in the Medical Humanities for the fall semester. Uh, our final meeting this semester is going to be on December 11th, so we're basically just going to hop skip over November, and everyone's cool with that, um, when Megan Coyer from the University of Glasgow will speak on James Hogg and illness narratives in a Scottish context. Um, my name for anyone who hasn't been here yet is Heidi Hawes. I'm a member of the Society of Fellows and one of the co-organizers of this lecture series, along with my colleagues, Arvin Higley, Carmel Raz, and Lan Lee. Uh, the goal of this series, as we've mentioned each meeting, is really embedded in its title, Explorations. Over the course of the semester, we had hoped to, and I would say we've succeeded in exploring some of the myriad approaches to and possibilities of studying the medical arts and the body, health, and disease by bringing in scholars from multiple disciplines to Columbia to discuss their work. I'm delighted to announce this lecture series is going to be extending into the spring semester. Uh, thanks to the support that we found on campus in attendance of these sessions and the conversations they've generated, and of course in the generous funding from our sponsors, the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center for the Humanities, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, and the Center of Science and Society. Um, so please come to our final session, December 11th, and look for announcements about our spring lineup in early 2018. So, for this evening's event, three ways of looking at an opium ball. I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, Ben Green, and our respondent, Joel Klein, uh, both of whom are familiar faces here at the Hammond Center. It's so great to see you both um, and have you here. Uh, ben Green is Assistant Professor of History at UC Santa Cruz. He received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in 2015. Uh, from 2015 to 2016, he was a member of the Society of Fellows here at Columbia. He's a historian of early modern world history with a particular interest in the history of the tropics, the slave trade, and the history of drugs and poisons, among other things. <laughs> uh, his many journal publications include articles in the Journal of Early Modern History, the History Compass, and the Journal of Early American History. His current research focuses on the origins of the global drug trade in the tropical belt, with a particular focus on the Portuguese and British empires in the 17th and 18th centuries. Our respondent, Joel Klein, is a postdoctoral Haas Fellow at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. He received his PhD at Indiana University in 2014. From 2014 to 2017, he was a lecturer in history and a postdoctoral research fellow in the Center for Science and Society here at Columbia University, where he was um, working on the Making and Knowing Project. Uh, he's a historian of early modern science and medicine, specializing in the cultural, intellectual, and social history of chemistry, chemical medicine, and the Holy Roman Empire. And his current book project is entitled Chemical Life in Early Modern Europe. Um, so thank you both so much for being here tonight. Uh, we're delighted to have you back at the Heyman Center and put you into a conversation. So, Ben, uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, well, um, thank you all for coming, and thanks to Heidi and Arden and Carmel and Lam for organizing uh, this series of talks. It's really, um, it's wonderful for me to be back here. I, I miss it a lot, and it's really great to, to see the same faces and, and uh, to be here again. So, thanks for that. And thanks to Joel for um, commenting as well. Um, so just to kind of situate what this talk is, this is basically the very final part of my first book that I've finished. Uh, this is now the, the final chapter, and I'm in the final stages of seeing how the larger book works as a larger entity. Um, so I'm like writing the introduction right now. And I'm very curious on your feedback, because this is kind of like the last month in which I can actually make real substantial changes. After that, it's just like you know doing desperate uh, pre-deadline stuff. So um, it's a little bit rough. I'm going to basically read part of the beginning because this is going to be the, the actual opening and I want to get that part right because I'm curious what people think of the way that I do the opening. But then from there I'm going to kind of skip about within the chapter uh, to give a sense of the larger argument. Uh, and I hope it's interesting and uh, please don't hesitate to be critical because this is the rough draft. This is the first time I present this material. Um, so I was trying to think of a joke to make at the beginning. I can't really make one because, I, you know, opium is somewhat of a, it can be kind of a sad topic sometimes. I didn't want to make a joke about opium. But I was looking for a Halloween costume, uh, and I found a monkey that can be strapped to your back. So it's literally a monkey on your back. And as some of you know, I really like these um, 
paintings of monk, drunk monkeys, pipe smoking monkeys in the 17th century, so it seemed kind of appropriate. So I just thought I would wear a monkey, or take, take the monkey off my back. <laughs> this, is, this won't be talking about the monkey material, but I can go back to that in the Q&A if it comes up. <laughs> um, so I want to open with this um, image that I've been sort of bewitched by for a while. It's actually outside of my time period. It's from 1850, but it does a lot of work in terms of situating um, the way I'm thinking about opium as an historical object. So I'm just going to start with zooming in on this image and we'll kind of pull back uh, as we go. And so now I'll just be reading the beginning of the chapter. Um, they have learned not to fear heights. To look down when standing at the highest levels is to face certain death. The shelves seem to go up for eternity. Even the boards that stretch between them are uncountable. Six men standing at their full height, arms stretched upward to pass the spears, one to the next, would reach only halfway to the top. The work has made them muscular. Most of them wear their hair in tightly woven braids. A few wear turbans. Everyone except the overseers is shirtless, clad only in white cotton shorts. They spend their lives in this series of vast chambers. There is a geometric rigor here, a symphony of spheres, planes, and lines. The spheres, however, are the only thing that really matters in this place. The spheres are why this place exists. There are tens of thousands of them. Each contains enough opium to kill over a hundred men. The total contents of the warehouse would, no doubt, be sufficient to kill each and every inhabitant of Patna, the metropolis in which the workers live. These workers deal in opium. And this is the image that it kind of reminds me of the end of Indiana Jones. It's just like mm. staggeringly huge. And as far as I can tell, it's not exaggerated. Like, this is an actual building, um, which there's other uh, images depicting. The image that memorialized these anonymous laborers is an opium warehouse in Northeast India. It was created in 1850. By this time, the global opium trade was an old and comfortable one. Its participants had famous names like Delano and Forbes. And although the opium trade would not become a true black market until the, well into the 20th century, by the 1850s it had already become a commerce in what was, in some places and in some contexts, an illegal drug. In 1799, the Jiaqing Emperor in China had banned imports of opium into Chinese territory. This edict had been ignored. Uh, however, the emperor condemned the drug again, and you can see the way it's being framed here is as a poison which is being kind of brought across borders by unscrup unscrupulous merchants, and even in the order that's condemning it and trying to ban it, it's actually admitting how popular it's becoming. So it's saying that the eaters of opium have become numerous. If this is a kind of a classic early modern thing where the law against something is actually evidence of it becoming more popular. It was the beginning of a dance that we're still locked in, a dance between what is legal and what people want, between taboos and desires. And in many times and places, it has been a dance between colonialism and sovereignty. Um, so this is a photograph that is a bit later than the Patna warehouse image, but uh, as you can see, the opium balls are actually very similar. It seems like the material culture is fairly conservative in the way that this opium is being conserved in this place. From the workers in the Patna warehouse to the fortunes of vast empires, the Jiaqing emperor was correct. Opium did have a harm. But to understand that harm, we need to go backwards to the world of the preceding centuries, a world in which opium was abundant and legal, and in fact, where the notion of legal didn't really exist in regards to drugs. Um, and this is an example that I really love. This is a um, from a popular print representing the different cries of Paris, so things like you know, a bread seller saying hot bread here. And one of the people that is so common that this was just like a typical cry is an operateur, which is like a drug merchant. And he's literally saying, um, J'ai des bons opiates pour les dents. I've got good opium for your teeth. Or I've got, I've got good opiates for your teeth. It's kind of one of the first uses of that word opiate as, as opposed to opium that I've seen. Um, but around this time is actually the moment when I think opium starts becoming suspect. And so what this larger chapter is about is that shift. Um, opium is actually not a foreign drug in Europe. It is actually native to Europe, which is not something I knew when I went into this project. Um, it's from the earliest evidence we have, as we'll talk about, is uh, actually from Neolithic France and Germany and Spain. 
Um, so something happened in the 16th and 17th centuries to make opium not just suspect, but also exotic size, foreign, um, sort of proto-orientalist. Um, or even just something which maybe a kind of unscrupulous street merchant would be selling as opposed to a doctor. So this talk is basically about the origins of that suspicion. It's tracing the beginning of this condemnation of a drug that actually has a very long and, and fairly um, uncontroversial history in Europe before this point. Um, so I'm also trying to bring together the lived experience of the opium workers, the people we see in these little miniature form in those warehouses, and patients and the doctors. So I, it's very difficult to do this, but I think it's important not just to focus on the physicians prescribing it. Um, I will also touch on addiction. I, in the Q&A, we can spend more time on that because I don't have time to embed all of that here, but I think it's important to kind of keep this in the background, that I don't treat opium as a thing which has no uh, biological meaning in history. That I think that we, could, we have to take it as a starting point that opium is addictive, and I'll get into that, a little bit of the science of this. Um, but of course, the way that that addictiveness is being expressed in a culture or society is completely different depending <coughs> on the context. So what I want to do is propose um, a kind of schema, three different ways that we can look at an opium ball. And there's actually many different, I'm not trying to say these are the only three ways, but it's three ways that I found helpful in thinking through the change over time. And the 17th century is the hinge of that, but in fact, we're still living through a period of change and opiates are being seen. I think the next 20 years, might, it might be very different than the last 20 years in terms of the cultural meaning of opium and opiate-derived substances. Um, so this is sort of the starting point. This is an opium ball from that engraving. Um, and it's a warehouse in India, and it kind of accords with a lot of the received wisdom we might have about opium as something from the East, something from India or China. Um, but actually, what I'm actually going to start with is the history of the opium poppy. Um, because it's worth keeping in mind that an opium ball is just a technological manifestation of a botanical, and something which has a much deeper history than simply the history of opium itself. Um, that history is actually, as I said, not very controversial. It just has a very long lineage in Greco-Roman medicine up to medieval medicine as a thing which would have been completely acceptable to prescribe or to, to grow yourself. Um, 15 to 18 is a loose framework for when it becomes orientalized or exoticized, but we definitely see the shift happening within that time period. And then by the 19th century, and a little bit before, we see the rise of the scientific re-manipulation of opium into something which is now no longer opium. It's laudanum, it's morphine, it's heroin, it's oxycontin. We're still living in that period where opium has now been kind of removed from its natural context and turned into a scientific object. Um, I'm kind of copying Carmel here with my little fancy PowerPoint. So you can <laughs> I learned that from you. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to get too much into what's going on with opium biologically, uh, but I do think it's important to kind of acknowledge what it is, what we're actually talking about here. So opium is the latex of the Papaver somniferum poppy. Um, and it's a pretty unique plant. It's not completely unique in this sense, but it's very rare for a plant to actually mimic a naturally occurring substance in the brain. And that's what opium does. Morphine is literally, um, if not molecularly identical to endorphins, um, it is close enough that the brain understands it as a neurochemical thing which bonds with receptors. Um, so I didn't actually know this until I started researching this, but the word endorphin is a shortened form of endogenous morphine. So the way that endorphins were discovered was by investigating what opium and opiate alkaloids are doing to the brain. Um, so I, I am not an evolutionary biologist. I don't know why certain plants have just seemingly randomly evolved to these molecules that fit into neuroreceptors in a way which we find appealing or unappealing. I suspect it has to do with the history of poisonous plant, like the the kind of evolutionary battle between plants and predatory animals trying to consume them. Um, what we do know is that for whatever reason, this, this poppy that produces a thing that humans like, a thing that bonds with opiate receptors in our brain, has a very deep history for that reason. And I think it's difficult to pinpoint the moment when opiate was domesticated for its pharmacological use as opposed to poppy seeds or poppy seed oil. Um, but I'll go through a few little I think highly indicative uh, pieces of archaeological evidence that show that there's a really deep history for the use of opiate 
as a thing, uh, use of opium as a thing which alters neurochemistry, not just as a food. Um, so we have found opium seed pods from 5000 BC in various archaeological sites in um, the beaker culture of Germany and France. Those ones are not possible to say this is a thing that was grown intentionally. Um, because, and this is something I also didn't realize, the close relative of the opium poppy is the common flower that we see in the margins of wheat fields and barley fields everywhere. And in fact, when I started looking in older um, uh, you know, manuscript illustrations of farming, I noticed that there's these little red flowers. I can't definitively say that those red flowers are poppies, but it seems very likely because these are just an extremely common agricultural weed. And we know that as agriculture spread from the Neolithic Near East, into Europe, um, there were little parasitic plants that kind of hitched a ride along with barley and wheat and so forth. And so it seems that it's possible, and this is the main theory that archaeologists have, that the opium poppy was originally just sort of a, um, a random weed plant that just happened to be propagated along with barley. Uh, in a way, it's sort of like dogs and cats, right? Just these things that, that hitch a ride along with the agricultural revolution. I suppose that's more like cats. Dogs were already there. Um, what we do know is that we start finding funeral uh, burial sites, I think that's starting around 3,500 BC, where there's actually ritualized burial of opium pots, uh, and this is in Spain. So that to me seems to be very strong evidence that it's no longer just a weed, uh, it's a woven grass pouch buried alongside it, a person who was intentionally buried with it. Um, and we could even go further if we want to get a little bit uh, ahistorical and think Maybe this was uh, homage to the fact that the poppy helped a dying person uh, feel less pain as they died. It could have been a direct reference to the pain-killing properties of it. Uh, we don't know, but it seems very likely that there was some kind of medicinal use there. Um, the earliest documented evidence that we have of opium being used as a drug, as a medicinal drug and also a recreational one, comes from ancient Greece. Um, this is kind of interesting because Demeter is actually shown holding a barley stock in an opium poppy. So again. There's that close association with farming. Um, and just in passing, it's a complete myth. This is just an annoying thing about the history of opium. Everyone always says the Sumerians had a uh, cuneiform word for opium. They called it hulio, <laughs> the joy plant, which I was so happy when I saw that because it's just great. They called it the joy plant. It's completely false. In fact, the joy plant is cucumber. <laughs> so make of that what you will. I, I found it kind of confusing. To, but as far as I looked into it, I just ended up reading the 70s cuneiform experts debating this, what type of cucumber it was. But it's all over the internet, and there's like literally 400 different books on Google Books that claim this. It's completely false. And actually, this helps my argument, because what I think is happening here is a kind of overlaying of a totally European native plant uh, with these Near Eastern, Indian, and a Persian uh, associations. And I think it makes sense to people when they write about opium that it would be Sumerian, and then Egyptian, and then Persian. That actually is false. In fact, the earliest evidence I could find for opium that's actually attested in the evidentiary record is Cypriot merchants carrying it to Egypt. So the earliest evidence of Egypt, uh, of Egyptian opium, is people who are carrying it from, from the Northwest, right? So in fact, opium is from Europe. This is just a starting point that I don't think it's recognized enough. Um, so now, the early modern period of opium actually gets refigured, not as a point where opium comes from India and reaches London and it's an exotic drug. It's actually the exact opposite. This is a point when European merchants begin trading opium and globalizing it as part of a larger colonial mission uh, of trading companies and also empires. So now if we kind of move forward into what is happening with opium as an as a early modern substance. Um, so one thing I didn't expect when I started this is a somewhat similar sort of disorienting thing, which is that I always thought opium smoking had some deep history in Asia, um, maybe perhaps in India, because opium, I mean, cannabis smoking has a very deep history in India, and I just always assumed that there was some kind of uh, connection there, that perhaps it had been mixed together. As far as I can tell, opium smoking is a direct product of Portuguese colonial intervention in South Asia and Persia. Meaning, even though the Portuguese didn't invent the idea of opium smoking, 
they served as middlemen joining together a technology, the pipe, with the substance. Um, the reason for this uh, is typically portrayed as the fact that pipes are from the New World. This is sort of the starting point, which is true. Europeans did not have a pipe technology, so far as I can tell. Uh, and we see this, you know, King James of England writes a condemnation of tobacco smoking. Sir Walter Raleigh, there's a famous, maybe apocryphal story that his servant saw him smoking a pipe, and the servant threw a pitcher of water onto him because he thought he was on fire, you know. So we have all these kinds of accounts that show that Europeans did not have a culture of smoking. In fact, they didn't have a verb for it. They drink smoke originally, and then they have to use smoke as a translative verb later. Um, but the New World is not the only place where pipes are found. There's actually a very long and well-attested archaeological record of cannabis smoking in Africa. Um, and this goes back at least as far as 1000 CE, so it's no question that this was something indigenous to East Africa and not brought there by the Europeans. Um, how does that relate to opium? What I've been starting to believe is that the key invention in the history of opium smoking, and the thing that turns opium into something which is then refigured as foreign and exotic and somewhat illegitimate to Europeans, is the invention of the water pipe, or the hookah, there's various names for it. Uh, this is a distinctively early modern invention. Uh, for one thing, the form that we see here, this blown glass, is actually high technology in this period. It's very difficult to blow glass like that. Um, and it's not something which is easily done. This would have been an expensive thing, and it was a thing that was a form of display, often in courts. Um, so this one is part of a account of the Shah of Persia's court, where he has this exotic pipe. If we look into it further, we find that the origins of this pipe come from seemingly a calabash, a water pipe made from calabash, uh, which is from East Africa. And I'll get later into a little bit of linguistic evidence that suggests that the route of transmission of the water pipe is separate from the route of transmission of New World, you know, indigenous American pipes. So this is actually two separate points of invention for pipe smoking technologies. And that this particular one is sort of an Indian Ocean version of it. The water pipe comes from, seemingly from Egypt or East Africa and then spreads throughout Persia and India in the 16th century, possibly carried by the Portuguese or possibly by other merchants. The point is, though, that uh, originally it was designed to smoke cannabis. It was only with the introduction of Portuguese traded tobacco from the New World that this thing, this hookah, becomes a kind of universal smoking device, a new technological implement where you can throw anything onto the top of it with the coals and see what happens. Um, so it, basically, uh, my argument here is that there's a technological innovation which results in a culture of experimentation. Um, People in different courts, in different situations uh, throughout the Indian Ocean are just trying out different things with these water pipes. Um, and we have documentary evidence attesting to the smoking, not just of tobacco, but I found a Portuguese doctor who recommends smoking ambergris mixed with rosemary for a cough, which sounds like it could actually work. I haven't tried it, but it probably smells nice at least. Um, and we also see uh, very early mentions of opium and cannabis mix being smoked. Um, and these are Portuguese texts talking about it. So that's one part of it. The other part is this, um, I keep saying the word orientalization. I don't know if that's the right word to use. We can get into that. But the point is that opium becomes very closely associated with Turks and Persians in particular. Um, and this is like so common that it's just like a, almost a viral meme in the early modern world. The Turk just becomes the guy that makes and smokes opium. And this is actually not, it, it, someone had to invent that. It's not a very like, um, uh, well-attested thing prior to the late 16th, early 17th century, and it just sort of takes off. I think it has to do with fears of the Ottomans in this period, so the Ottomans are expansionist in this time, and they're getting kind of scary. And we see this in the descriptions themselves. When you read them, it's very interesting because it refigures opium intoxication as something which is stimulant and something which is violent. Um, it's almost the inverse of the 19th century dreamy, bohemian, Baudelaire kind of opium that I came into this project imagining to find. Um, so I have this um, one quote, which I'm just going to read in brief. Uh, it's from a, a Giuseppe Donzelli, I butchered that, Giuseppe Donzelli, who's a Neapolitan apothecary, who says that Turkish soldiers who eat it, especially when they are in times of danger at war, becoming almost drunken with it, and thereby not noticing their danger. So it's a bit like a Viking berserker, is how it's being portrayed. Um, and then we also have this very interesting, very early quote 
from a, a manuscript collected by Charles Boxer. It's the earliest Spanish account of the Philippines. Um, and I find this kind of interesting because it's actually turning opium into a foreign thing at a very early date. Um, so w what they're talking about here, antion, is that it's being portrayed as a kind of Philippine herb, like a foreign thing that results in, or not, it's more like Pan East Indies or um, this manuscript goes widely in talking about the Philippines and the kind of other cultures which are influencing it. So here it's talking about Mal M M Malaysian warriors who are basically uh, running amok. This is the origin of the phrase running amok. Um, but if you look at the word itself, and here I'm going off of Boxer, he, you know, he's like the expert in Portuguese history, so he would, I trust him on this etymological link. He thinks that it's actually, the manuscript was written in Portuguese and it was then translated uh, into Spanish and it survives as a Spanish manuscript. He thinks this is a transcription error for the Portuguese word amphial, which is just Greek. It's just from the Greek word opium. So in fact, what's happened here is a Greek word for opium has gotten turned into this kind of um, exotic East Indies thing that makes people run them up. Um, and this kind of thing keeps happening, this transcription error, translation errors, or even intentional um, tweaking of the substance to make it seem frightening. It, it keeps reappearing in the 16th and 17th centuries as a sort of token of the Oriental world or the East Indies. Um, and we see something similar happening with, with uh, the pipe. So, as I said, the water pipe really was a foreign technology to Europeans. It doesn't get mentioned very much until the end of the 16th century, I think is the very earliest mention of, of water pipes. I'm just going to call them water pipes because there's so many different names for them. Um, and the way it's usually portrayed is in the somewhat uh, humoral terms. So in this case, Jean Chardon is saying that it's actually requirements in places like Turkey and Persia because the air is more hot and dry and the spirits are more subtle. So it's almost as if the climate requires it, this drug, this hot drug, to be filtered through cold water. And in fact, the earliest water pipes, uh, the accounts of them in European sources usually say that it's rose water, which might be significant, or various kinds of perfumed waters. Um, and, you know, it's easy just to see this as, a, oh, that's an aesthetic thing just to make it smell nice. But it's important to keep in mind that in this world, that could actually be conceived of as physically changing the effect of this drug. It's not just a, a, a sort of, you know, additional quality. The filtering it through a certain type of water really changes it. Um, this is my like, little bit of etymological evidence that there's something going on with water pipes as something which is from Africa as opposed to the New World. Um, and specifically, there's a connection with the Portuguese and water pipes. So it's a little bit tenuous, but bear with me. Um, as you can see, the word pipe is very similar in most European languages. And I, I don't know Swedish or, or Norwegian or whatnot, but I imagine it's usually something like tea. Um, the reason for this is actually onomatopoeia. On a more poetic, so to say, it's the sound of a bird. It's a bird peeping, right? And in fact, the uh, earliest uses of pipe actually can also apply to flutes. Um, the Latin word for pipe could be a flute. The Portuguese word for pipe is cachimbo, which is right off the bat clearly not related to the word for pipe in these other languages, and also not European. It's actually from Kimbundu, which is the sort of uh, language continuum. So the, group of dialects in present-day Angola. And this is easily seen in the Kimbundu word for pipe, Kishimbu, it's the same word. What I find really interesting here is that the, and I'm getting this from a etymological study of Kimbundu, which is from the 70s, and I don't know, I'm not a linguist, I'm not sure if this is actually well tested, but this is a, at least a theory in print, um, that the word for pipe in Kimbundu comes from the word for well, water well. Why would that be? I think the only explanation for this that makes any sense is that the original Kimbundu word for pipe referred to a water pipe, a reservoir of water through which smoke is pulled. And as I said, though, uh, this is usually associated with uh, cannabis smoking. We know this from actually doing archaeological analysis of cannabinoids found in um, digs in, in sub-Saharan Africa. But there's other plants that are being smoked with this as well, like Daga from South, South Africa. Um, what seems to have happened is that the Portuguese adopted this 
word, and also perhaps this technology, in the sort of trading worlds of both the Atlantic slave trade and the Indian Ocean trade. And they begin carrying around these kashimbo. Um, again, this is a little bit tenuous, but I do think that there's a link to be made because the earliest references to smoking that I found in Portuguese use the verb kashimbar. So as I said, there was no verb for smoking, and they had to just make up the word to smoke or to drink. The Portuguese have already made an African word, kashimbar, for the for the trans the verb of smoking. And significantly, the, the earliest references to this include that rosemary and amber grease thing. Uh, so it's not just talking about tobacco, it's this kind of experimental culture of just try, see what happens when you smoke through a water pipe. Okay. So the third part, the third way of looking at opium is sort of a departure from this, but it's not a huge departure. Um, I kind of grappled as I do this book project with how much I want to talk about 19th century medical chemistry, uh, because in many ways it seems very distinct from the stuff I'm talking about in my other chapters. My other chapters have um, passages on the search for chinchona bark in, in the Portuguese Amazon and the African po poison trials in 17th century Angola, and these uses of drugs which do not have a strong correlate with modern pharmacy, right? things which failed as drugs is a big theme of the book. Um, but by adding this chapter on opium, I really have to grapple, I think, with what opium does in our culture now, and what it did in 19th and 20th century cultures. Um, because it's very historically important, and I, you know, I could, if I had more time, I would allude more to the contemporary sort of debates around opiates, but you can kind of read the news and see what's going on with that um, presently. And in many ways, the contemporary function of opiates comes right up to the edge of my project, and I think I have to include something about morphine for this larger story to kind of make sense historically. Um, but it's very hard to integrate, because what I've been talking about has been a form of technology, you know, applying this new technology of a water pipe to various substances and documenting the effect they have. Um, and it was something that European natural philosophers were very interested in, because it was quasi-alchemical, it was a kind of transmutation of a substance from a physical object to a smoke, which is very you know, relevant. And it's also a psychoactive substance which ties directly into debates about how the mind works and how we perceive things and how perception is phys physically um, structured in the brain. Um, but the history of morphine is a tricky one because it's sort of its own thing. And the way it's usually written about is as this moment of invention which sets off a whole chain of events which have very little to do with what I was just talking about. Um, and I actually am starting to think that this is part of this larger story of opium becoming exoticized. In my conclusion, we'll kind of talk more about that. But I wanna, what I want to talk about now is just what happened in the decades before the discovery of morphine, which was 1804, um, in terms of chemical analysis of opium and attempts to, to sort of um, chemically alter opium on a physical level to have different effects on the body and mind. Um, so, this is one example of the types of writings that you see from European natural philosophers who are doing experiments involving opium, not just to see what opium does, because it's by then, but it's been very well established. People know what opium does. People take opium very, very frequently. So, I would wager, it's hard to say, but out of the Portuguese medical texts I've looked at extensively, opium figures in maybe one fourth of all recipes. Um, so it's not like an unfamiliar drug by any means. Uh, but there's a huge amount of debates about what's actually happening in the brain and in the body when you take it. Um, so in this case, this is sort of interesting because it's a Frenchman uh, in 1751 who's actually directly conflating the effects of opium on the brain, and here he's talking about opium, um, with Newtonian physics, basically. And he's thinking about the nature of light. He's thinking that perhaps it's electrical, or it has analogies with electricity. Um, it's important to say that what electrical meant to him is not quite the same as what it means to us. He's thinking more about what we would call animal spirits, just this kind of physiological vitiating uh, forces that move through the body. But he is clearly thinking about it in, in um, terms which are uh, structured by advances in uh, early modern physics and thinking about 
chemistry. Um, and we see a lot of this kind of language of nervous fluids and animal spirits and currents and blockages and so forth. Um, in many ways, and I was actually talking to Alex about this earlier, this is not super new. I mean, this is something which would not have been hugely different from how a medieval humoral physician would have thought about opium, because it's still thought of as a substance, a physical thing in your brain that causes some kind of blockage, or causes some kind of change in the brain's physical form resulting in intoxication or addiction or the relief of pain. Um, there's a few differences, though. So, one example is that, um, I think it's, um, yeah, this of us, this guy that I'm quoting here, later on in this description of opium, he actually refers to um, doing dissections of Turks who have died on the battlefield, because he takes it for granted the Turkish warriors have consumed opium just before their death, right? This is, again, like a hugely popular belief. So he just thinks, okay, here's a bunch of Turkish warriors, they're all opium addicts, and we can learn about the effect of opium habituation on the body and mind by looking at the, their bodies. So he's actually talking about anatomical dissection of, of Turkish warriors, and then he uses this to make an argument about the humoral nature of opium. So even though he comes off as being somewhat conservative in the way he's thinking about it, aside from the references to Newton, he's also saying opium is uh, notably cool, so he's thinking still humorally. He's using this very strange mixture of experimentalism uh, to make this argument. And he's also doing this interesting study, and he's not alone in this, this is very common actually. He's actually taking samples of human blood, human lymph and blood serum, like in jars, and adding opium to them, and seeing what happens to them like outside of the body. Uh, which has a strange flavor of modern medical studies, right? It's not that different from a cell culture that you add something to. Um, and in fact, you can draw a direct line between the, those cultures of experimentation. But the arguments he's making is that on the basis of this are very uh, early modern. He's saying that, oh, it coagulates the lymph, so therefore it has a fermenting effect on such and such part of the brain and so forth. It doesn't quite connect to a more 19th, 19th 20th century theory of mind or kind of early proto-neuroscience, but he's kind of getting there with this experimentalism regarding the effect of opium on the brain. Um, and there's sort of a series, an increasing wave of um, chemical analysis of opium that tries to get at this question of what's happening in the mind subjectively, not just mechanically, but increasingly what is the psychoactive effect of opium doing to you to make you feel a certain way. And it's worth pointing out that this is a pen. Um, pen has a great collection of early modern uh, medical manuscripts and cookbooks and so forth. And I find this one really interesting because it's actually, this is a direct copy from a book about the history of opium, right? And it's showing a pipe, a Persian pipe. And it's, it's a completely a fair copy. Like the, the text next to it is just directly from the book. Nothing has changed. To my, I was hoping something had been changed, but it's identical. And the drawing is identical. But what, what's really interesting is that the author of this book called Viridiarum Regale is sort of a compendium of medical and alchemical knowledge. Um, the author chooses to include this opium pipe alongside a chemical retort, like the tools of a chemist. And it's not that strange, because if you look at the shapes of the glass, they're very similar forms. Um, so the author is actually sort of seeing this Persian or Indian uh, smoking device in the context of cutting-edge natural philosophy, technologies of natural philosophy. Um, so we see kind of a convergence here of this sort of emergence of a theory of mind based on how opium changes your rational perception of things, and also a new interest in opium being chemically manipulated. Um, and this is the backstory for the sort of story of morphine, which usually just kind of comes out fully formed and then proceeds from there. Um, I'm not trying to say that there's total continuity between 19th century medical chemistry and the stuff I've been talking about, because there really is a decisive shift in terms of the tools being used and the terminology. Um, it says 1805 here. It seems that he may have discovered it in 1804, but again, anytime you start talking about discoveries in the history of science, it all breaks down. Um, it is true that Sarah Turner is uh, the discoverer of morphine, is kind of the founder of a new domain in chemistry, the chemistry of alkaloids. Alkaloids, a handy way of thinking about them is anything that ends with I-N-E is an alkaloid. So caffeine is the most famous, but you can think of many others, cocaine, 
etc. Um, and these are, it's a loose-knit term, but it is a discrete chemical category for a category of plant-derived substances that are very strongly psychoactive. Not all of them are, but for whatever reason, the alkaloids map on very closely to things which affect the human brain. And if you look at the history of drugs, alkaloids are the dominant category. Um, heroin's an alkaloid, um, quinine is an alkaloid, caffeine, the most popular drug of all. Um, and Sarah Turner's methods did lead to a kind of chain reaction in the, the history of chemistry because once he found this category of molecule, it became much easier to look for other ones. Um, so there's sort of a, you know, atropine is discovered 1819, caffeine 1820, nicotine 1828, cocaine 1860, and I believe actually the sort of early history of the search for a DNA molecule comes from this period too, because the building blocks of DNA, I think the very first one is isolated, I think it's lysine, um, in around this period using similar methods. So there is something different in this alkaloid era of chemistry. Um, and there's also something different in the way that drugs are being sold, so I can't get into it too much, um, but Sarah Turner did not really profit much from his discovery of morphine. He actually sold the patent for it to a little pharmaceutical concern in Germany called, um, oh, I'm forgetting which one it is. I think it's Merck. <laughs> Bayer and Merck. There's, but Bayer and Merck are both really modern apothecary shops which kind of take over the world. I believe he sells it to like the son of the founder of the Merck, uh, House of Merck. Um, <laughs> and around 1830, it just takes off. So in fact, it's a common story in the history of science where he does not really get any recognition for this beyond a small circle of chemists, and he doesn't really profit from it that much, but he sets in motion a sort of chain of events which leads to a total alteration in the material culture of drugs, where drugs are now being advertised in newspapers. Uh, this sort of, we see the beginnings of this in the 17th century with the kind of ads for various patent medicines and early printed material, but this really mass targeting of a popular reading public trying to get them to buy a drug with some cool name with a picture of a little baby who's being given a spoonful of heroin and is now smiling. This is like a real ad, like this is an actual type of ad. Um, that really comes into its own in the 19th century um, and creates a, basically a huge, huge audience of op what we would call opiate addicted people because um, one of the major ways of getting babies to stop crying in the 19th century was to give them morphine and heroin. This is a, a agreed upon use of this substance and actually if we look at to go back a little bit, it, I, I didn't even notice this until I found the image and looked at it later. You look at the label, the directions say three months old, two drops, <laughs> one year old, four drops, four years old, six, six drops. Years. So a three month old is given two drops, which is actually like, I mean, a three month old should not be given any drops. <laughs> it's bizarre that they even go that young. Um, but that, this is a major use of, of opiate drugs, is um, for infants. So it kind of changes our idea of opiate addiction if we realize that a, a very large percentage of elite Victorians grew up addicted to opiates, or at least having some kind of relationship with opiates that we today would find problematic, obviously. Um, okay, so what is the prehistory of Sarah Turner? Oh, just as a sideline, I love this little detail. Sarah Turner actually um, settles in Hamlin, where the Pied Piper is from. <laughs> And he, he opens an apothecary called the Rat House Apothec, uh, which I thought was like Rat House because it's in Hamlin, but apparently it means like Parliament or something. <laughs> so, oh well. But it might have been a pun. I don't know. Someone who speaks German should tell him more if that's a pun or not because it seems too perfect. Um, there's also, I can't verify this, but some accounts of him say that he was addicted to morphine himself, which would not have been hugely surprising. And we do know. Um, that when he's describing his discovery, he's taking huge doses of it. This is the era of heroic medicine, as they call it. So he's taking like massive overdoses of morphine, and we know this because he literally says, I took such and such dose, and I felt flushed and had an agreeable sensation. And then he's like, I took double the dose, and I felt sleepy, but really good. I took double that dose, and I fell asleep for 24 hours. Or something like that. <laughs> so this is basically OD on, on morphine, you know? Um, so he's like, okay, the, the dose should just be the first thing, shouldn't it? Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Um, like five minutes left? Yeah. Okay, that's good. I'm, I'm wrapping it up. Um, <laughs> uh, so, 
this is a, I don't quite know where to fit this in. This is from a different chapter, but I wanted to kind of allude to it. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. It's a James Gilray Prince satirizing um, the early uses of nitrous oxide as this kind of uh, uh, performative drug that has these amazing effects on people. So this that's um, Davy up there um, administering it to someone who's then, you know, lampooned in a very typical, you know, British cartoonish sort of way. Um, I think, I'm still figuring out how much we need to fit the history of opiates into this history of this kind of invention of new drugs in the late 18th century, because nitrous oxide, laughing gas, is a very interesting case in the sense that it's one of the first drugs to have been, to have arisen out of a, a self-aware culture of enlightenment rational chemistry, where they, it's literally a thing that you have to create. I mean, it might exist in nature in some forms, but the form that Sir Humphrey Davy was using was something he made himself in a lab. And you can actually see him making it there, or at least preserving it. Um, and in this sense, it sort of represents even more of a break than morphine, right? Because it's not like a uh, Amazonian herb that is then processed and turned into something which is fit for Europeans to consume. It's literally made by a chemist in a lab and then distributed from there. I think it does fit in with the history of morphine, though. Um, and so what I'll end with is this um, point I want to make about why it mattered to Europeans to make opium into something that was exotic and foreign in the early modern period. And I'm not saying this was an intentional process, um, but I'm saying that it was a slow, iterative, iterative kind of process of evolution of what opium did uh, in, in a society and was perceived to do in the brain that resulted in some way in uh, a state of affairs that we're still living in, basically. This bifurcation between drugs as an illegal substance and drugs as a pharmaceutical substance. Um, and although that, that split doesn't really get formalized until really the 20th century, and in fact, I never know when to say it, it is formalized because it still is not fully figured out, right? It's still in flux. Um, I do think the beginnings of a split are apparent in this early modern exoticization or, ori or orientalization of opium. And by the comparative uh, point of having this, you know, sort of well-established, nice-looking gentleman with a cravat who makes morphine for you, it's very pure, it's in a nice little bottle, it's sold to you in a shop where someone's wearing a lab coat and so forth. All of these tokens of what a pharmacy is have to be invented in the 19th century. Um, and it's a slow process. What I think is partly happening here is a very, um, typically 18th century European desire to rationalize drug taking. And it, it, it goes back to those efforts to like study what opium does to blood, study different ways of making opium to make it less addictive or to make it have different effects. And it also goes back to that association, association with the Turks and Persians, which I really think is sort of a random, you know, a product of a technological change that could have gone differently, this introduction of water pipes to Asia and, and therefore opium smoking becomes an Asian thing. Um, so, let me see, just finish up here. I'll just read the little final bit because this is from the book as well. Previously, efforts had been made to disassociate drugs like opium from the non-European and frequently as, as enslaved labor that produced them. Now it was possible to dissociate a drug from nature itself. So this, even though it's being mocked, this is a major breakthrough in the history of drugs or at least to materially remove it from the world of botany and plants. A Neolithic flower had become a nondescript white powder, the product of a pharmacy and not a farm. So now we get to a, an important question. It seems clear that opium shifted from being a traditional indigenous remedy of Europe to something foreign and exotic sometime in the period between 1500 and 1750, 1550 and 1750. It is also clear that the isolation of morphine changed the game when it came to selling and marketing drugs. Drug sellers can now move beyond the vagaries of early modern drug names, because it's very hard to translate different names if you don't have a, a chemical name for something. In effect, this is almost like a um, what was happening in 18th century botany with Linnaeus giving a well-defined term. Um, and also thinking about in molecular terms changes what we're talking about. We're talking about an invisible thing inside of a drug and not a larger agglomeration of 20 different substances. Um, but what were the larger effects of this shift? Uh, can we generalize out from the history of opium? Um, I think part of what was happening here was the emergence of early modern states that tried to rationalize and also regularize 
the way drugs worked in a society. So this also ties into the history of alcohol as well. Um, by turning opium into a thing that was non-Christian, non-European, unhealthy, violent, etc., uh, it allowed for a kind of artificial distinction to be made between that and between morphine, which had a huge status as a product of rational chemistry. And it also allowed for the opium trade to be pushed off to the colonies and not really thought about. Um, because in many ways, the opium trade can be thought of in terms somewhat similar to the slave trade. And early modern people did think of it that way. There was no word for addiction. They would say a slave to the drug. Um, and in a similar way, it was a thing that resulted in tons of money, but was not spoken of much in polite society. And this is going up to you know, the Americas in, up until 1900, pretty much. Um, as I said, one half of Roosevelt's family was in the opium trade. Um, so I think there's this binary that is formed, an artificial one between the crazed Turk on opium and the rational physician with morphine. And I don't, I, I don't know how much to spell out the present day implications of that, but I think it's clear that that's shaping the way we see drugs today. Um, whenever there's a drug craze, um, it's often framed in terms similar to the Turk who's on his crazy opium or the, the Malaysian who's running amok, right? And then whenever, there, whenever there's an advance, for instance, Purdue Pharmacy in the 90s with OxyContin, it's portrayed with a guy wearing a lab coat telling you about the new breakthrough, which is going to save the world and cure people of pain and so forth. So I think without making it too historically undifferentiated, we really do live in a world of drug taking and it was shaped by this story. Center, to the organizers of this series. Uh, some of my comments are on the written chapter, and they may be confusing to the audience, but hopefully they'll be useful to um, There's a lot going on in this chapter on the three ways of looking at the opium ball. It covers a great deal of history, um, focusing primarily on 17th to 19th centuries, but with a good deal of ancient and medieval background thrown in. Um, for good measure. Um, so I really like that you provide some background on the plant itself as a, something that's addictive over uh, its history. Uh, I thought that was a very interesting point. But um, this paper, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your project in general is ultimately about power and the authority of the state to criminalize drugs and addiction itself. Um, so by way of three freeze frames here, uh, we learn about the changing role of opium as a drug from the early modern era to the 19th century. Um, much of the paper, paper focuses on the irony of how a plant that is native to Europe came to be exoticized and associated with Eastern cultures. Then how this uh, orientalized opium became disassociated from these meanings over the centuries as it was transformed into a modern drug. Uh, you focus on morphine. Uh, you then conclude that these processes of orientalization and modernization were important. Forces that contributed to the development and enforcement of legal norms, uh, but that these processes did not work alone and were joined by the emergence of the modern concept of addiction, um, which was also viewed by Europeans as foreign. So to start our discussion, I have several extended questions and some minor suggestions here and there. Um, First, I know the goal here is to freeze frame on several specific times and places to tell a particular story about opium, but I wonder if some additional frames are needed or if we could freeze for a while longer uh, with greater detail on some of the existing frames. So, for instance, in a history about exoticization, um, I wanted to know more in particular about class. Uh, and I wondered if you might use class more as an interpretive lens here. So your account of exoticization focuses on the etymology of terms for opium, its use in medieval Persia and in Arabic medicine, um, and then in the material culture of pipe smoking. What I thought might add an interesting dimension and one that would include elements of class, more particularly luxury and commerce, is a discussion of the 
to my knowledge, main drugs that were reputed to contain opium, theriac, and mithridate, or mithridatium. Uh, mithridate was reputed to have been formulated by Mithridates the sixth, king of Pontus, uh, first century BCE. There are a number of accounts of the diverse formulations of Mithridatium over the centuries, but it often contained at least a small amount of opium in addition to a host of other rare and expensive ingredients. Pliny noted that uh, the substance was composed of 54 ingredients. Uh, theriac, sometimes rendered in English as treacle, uh, was of a similar composition, although later recipes called for uh, fun stuff like bezoar stone, viper flesh, uh, other animal ingredients. By the late Middle Ages, Venetian theriac, the best theriac by, was regarded as having the highest quality. It was made once a year in a public ritual observed by officials and included 64 ingredients and it took 40 days to prepare. So because many of the ingredients, or at least the ostensible ingredients, had to be imported into early modern Europe, it was regarded as exotic. Because of this exoticism, it was generally rather expensive. Um, it was often grouped with other exotic and expensive medicaments. So in 1665, the Parisian physician Guy Petain wrote, I have never ordered bezoar, cordial waters, theriac, mithridate, confection of hyacinth, emetic wine, pearls, nor precious stones, nor others of the Arab bagatelle. Um, it's an interesting little barb tossed in there at the end. Um, likewise, Mithridates has been understood in diverse ways throughout history, but in general, while the Pontic Empire was Hellenized, it did have uh, Eastern inflections. I'm not sure if physicians conceived of Mithridates as especially valuable because of its Eastern origins, but this would be interesting to know. Um, in any case, my general question here is what you think of tossing Theriac and Mithridate into the mix. Um, if exotic compounds like this change your thinking on opium as a simple, um, and if their status as expensive luxury medicines can inject elements related to class into your analysis. So second, the story you're telling here is largely about how opium came to be seen as harmful and as a danger to the state. Uh, you discuss the many examples of how opium was believed to influence the behavior of non-European individuals and especially warriors. Um, Two additional areas that I thought would be valuable to your case, especially because they have significant moral dimensions, are first, and you touch on this just a bit, at least in the chapter, opium's effect on sex, and second, its use in suicide. Mm -hmm. um, taboos re regarding opium's use as an agent of suicide go back to Pliny. It's common throughout history. Um, often a mixture of opium and hemlock was taken. Um, and an interesting quote regarding opium and human population comes from the Dutch merchant and historian Jan Haugen van Linscholten, who said, and I don't have this up, but it's fun anyways, um, he said, the, the Indians use opium most for lechery, for it maketh a man to him uh, hold his seed long before he sheddeth it, which the Indian women much desire, that they may shed their nature likewise with the man. Uh, also, he and many other individuals at this time took this view of opium because they thought of it as a, quote, kind of poison. So at the beginning of your talk, we heard a bit about how opium was sometimes thought of as a poison in relatively recent history. But I think it might be fruitful to contextualize opium within the general intellectual history of poisons. Uh, and I think much of the heavy lifting uh, on this has already been done by Fred Gibbs in his excellent dissertation, Medical Understandings of Poisons, circa 1250 to 1600. Um, it's kind of a hard dissertation to get. It might be in the podcast, but you should all should read it. It's really <laughs> excellent. Um, so I, I just wonder if there's a larger story to be told here about opium as a poison, and eventually a poison to be outlawed. So third, regarding the material culture of pipes, uh, this is one of my favorite parts of the talk. Um, yeah, if you could pull up the image. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the pipe discussed in BNF Manuscript Francais 640, which we studied on the Making and Knowing project, uh, in which I worked on with a student, Jocelyn Devaney, who's here, uh, who wrote an excellent annotation essay on the recipe entitled Médecine des Orientaux contre toute maladie. Um, yeah, there it is. And there's the pipe. 
So this recipe describes a pipe using a pipe to insufflate the smoke of rosemary uh, into the mouth, into the head, in order to purge it of colds, rheums, and other maladies. So this manuscript was written in the late 16th century, give or take, probably near Toulouse. And what is especially interesting is that the author practitioner included a drawing of the clay pipe. Um, it's difficult to trace the precise origins of this particular pipe and how they made their way into Toulouse uh, and into Europe in general. But it does appear that they were relatively novel in Europe in the mid-16th century. Likewise, that there was a conflation between pipes from the New World and those from regions like Persia, China, so I think there's a really interesting overlap here regarding themes of orientalization and technological development. Um, one thing, though, uh, I would just like to know more about the actual material culture of smoking opium. Because as I understand, an opium pipe, which is really an invention of the 18th century. Yeah, yeah that's an important distinction. Yeah. That I'm talking about a proto-opium yeah. pipe. Yeah. Um, so the, the opium pipe that we're familiar with from opium dens is actually used to vaporize opium rather than combusting it, which is a much more potent way to ingest it. Uh, actually, combusting it, um, as I understand, uh, destroys many of the psychoactive alkaloids. Um, so, I have another question about material culture that should provide a good segue into talking about alchemy, which is, of course, what I like to do. Um, in short, I'm curious about the history of laudanum and what it might say about processes of exoticization. In the medieval pharmacopoeia, up until the end of the 16th century, laudanum, um, generally referred to labdanum, uh, sometimes lapdanum or ladanum. It's a sick, sticky brown astringent resin uh, known since antiquity and obtained from the Quistus ladanifer and the Quistus creticus. It's a species of rock rose. It was often collected in goat beards. Um, so it's still widely claimed that Paracelsus of Hohenheim, the famous chemical physician and uh, putative alchemist of the 16th century, it's often claimed that he was the first to synthesize what would come to be known as laudanum, that is, the alcoholic tincture <coughs> containing opium, and that he carried his laudanum in the pommel of his sword, um, as Henry Seigerist showed in the 1940s, Paracelsus' works do not contain tincture of opium as laudanum. Um, instead, he often discusses the resinous substance, and at other times, so the ladanum, at other times he does, discusses laudanum as a mysterious arcanum or secret containing exotic and expensive ingredients like pearls and gold. It appears that it was only in the works of Paracelsus' followers that laudanum opiatum was born. So right around the turn of the century, at the end of the 16th century. So for instance, the French Paracelsian, Joseph Duchesne, sometimes called Quercetanus, defended this Paracelsian um, understanding of laudanum, which is not actually from Paracelsus. He wrote, indeed, opium is put into this substance, but of far better preparation than is commonly in use, not without the spirit of wine or the infusion of diamber, by certain months, not without the essence of saffron, castor, corals, pearls, mumia, my favorite little bits of mummies, um, and the oils of cinnamon, cloves, mace, and aniseed. So it was of a similar composition to theriac and mithridatum, but what Duchenne and many other Paracelsian chemical authors claimed they were doing in their better preparations was actually fixing it and changing it into um, hesitate to use this term, but more of an artificial substance. Um, removing, as the chemist Angelo Sala put it, the sulfurous malignity. Um, so within this chapter, you suggest that such alchemical transformations were um, redeemed in the 18th century, brought back into the main line of the history of science. Um, I just wondered if you could clarify exactly what you mean there. Um, and as a historian of alchemy, um, I would argue alchemy was in the main line of the history of science, especially when it came to developments related to drugs, but that's a different kettle of fish. Um, so, related to this, I would suggest that the treatments of, the treatment of psychoactive drugs, like other um, chemicals or substances, owes in large part to chemists in the late 16th, early 17th century, who thought that they could fix the substance or isolate its essences 
through chemical means, uh, regardless of whether they believed its power was caused by an occult or a hidden virtue. Um, Sala is especially interesting in this regard because in addition to his interest in fixing opium, he wrote one of the most important treatises on opium in the seventh, early 17th century called Opiologia. Um, uh, so he also wrote one of the most important works regarding the history of the concept of a chemical element, this, in his Anatomy of Vitriol, where he mounted an early defense of the permanence of chemical substances after they were separated from an initial compound substance. So he would basically take vitriol, take it apart, put it back together. This came to be known as a redintegration, and it was uh, an important part of 17th and 18th century chemistry. Um, I've done all that. Finally, I wonder if you can say something about the relationship between the two processes that you've identified here, and perhaps be explicit about what the relationship is between these two processes. On the one hand, there's the disassociation of opium from a culture uh, and from its origins, whether those origins are ostensible or real origins. On the other, you have the orientalization and uh, the exoticization of opium. You have the imposition of a culture. Uh, are these two processes inverse, uh, unrelated, uh, or orthogonal, or some other uh, way related? That's all. Start by saying, <laughs> that was an equal to this uh, phrasing. But I actually was, I know you were probably just following your 18th century. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it was almost more like, um, well, I guess this is one way of answering a couple of them or kind of responding to a couple of them together. So, history of laudanum is super interesting, and I was being very sloppy by having my image of morphine being an actual laudanum bottle. Uh, the reason for that, though, is that a lot of them, as you said, completely keep changing. Every decade, practically, it's different. So by the 19th century, a lot of them is often just a name for morphine and some stuff added to it. Um, that's what that bottle was. And clearly, you know, if you go back to the book period era, <laughs> it's not the same thing. <laughs> I didn't know that about the book period, so that's a good detail. Um, and I agree with you. Paracelsus is surprisingly not that important in the history of a lot of them. At least in the kind that I'm trying to talk about. Um, but then the opiado is of course called it. Yeah. I've tried to get track down where the switch happens. Yeah. And it's really I difficult. think it's um Persidanus. I know I'm Duchenne, yeah. Duchenne, yeah. Yeah, Duchenne, yeah. I think that's this that seems to be the guy who does it and then he attributes it backward to the great master, which sort of makes sense in the way that early modern people you know, write about stuff. Um, what's actually the key thing that I didn't talk about here, but uh, in the larger chapter I do is Sydenham's drops. Which again, I'm not totally sure if Thomas Sydenham actually invented them, at least as, as people supposed. But at least Thomas Sydenham's laudanum, as, as they often call it, seems to have been the major recipe, um, which kind of took over in the 18th century, especially as being this is how you make laudanum opiata. Um, that one is actually interesting because it contains many of the same uh, Indies spices. So. If you actually look at it, it's usually just glossed as like opium suspended in some kind of alcoholic liquor. And then this is an actual chemical reaction that happens that really does make opium much stronger to do that um, chemically. It, it, it extracts the opiate alkaloids more effectively. But he also includes cloves and cinnamon and I think some other things um, like aqua celestia or something like that. Very typical stuff that Paracelsus was familiar with as well. Um, so what's going on with that and also with Mithridate? And um, there you go. And I think I think I would push back on Mithridate and Theriac being Eastern in a real sense. Yeah. You know, they're more like Venetian, which is a very interesting middle ground. Um, it makes sense that Venetian Theriac is the most prized because it's sort of pseudo-Eastern, and, and so also is uh, Mithridates. Uh, you know, he's kind of 
haunted kingdom, like you said, is sort of a mixture. Um, an interesting thing here is that the word, as far as I can tell, teriyak might be from Hebrew. If you're looking at the etymology, it's very old, but it's used by the Greeks, I think. And it has a kind of unknown origin from the Greeks. But to this day, the Persian word for opium is teriyak. So again, it's they're getting it from the West. They're not, they don't have a homegrown word for it. It was obviously introduced at some point by Greek-speaking people and called teriyak. So we can even pinpoint the chronology to some degree, right? Um, I, I need to work that in. It, as you say, it's so complicated and changing that it's hard to make it equate to opium. I want to be careful about not just saying these are all opiates, because what does that mean if we're talking about goat beard roses and stuff? <laughs> or even about Mithridate, which maybe didn't have opium. Maybe it just had a bunch of stuff and they said it had opium and it, it, it was a way of um, sort of hiding what you're actually putting in it. Um, to get to class, that's an interesting point. I, I, I think it's true that the top level medicines associated with opium were extremely expensive, but if you look at the, the medical books I've looked at, it, it seems like there's many household remedies that effectively do contain opium as well. They'll just say something like, um, take white poppies and dissolve them in spirit of wine for a week. You know, that, effectively, that's making homemade laudanum. And we can't say for sure these puppies have opiates in them, but virtually every pop of Ursumifrim does, including the ones that are growing in front of people's houses in like upstate New York and stuff, right? They all have opium. Even poppy seed bagels, as some people may know, have traces of opium on them. So I think it's, there's my many British layers. Grandmother. What? My British grandmother grew poppies. In your front yeah. yard? Yeah. Yeah. There's an interesting thing about it. I, just, I'll, I'll show that now, but there's a, um, an early 19th century account of Lancashire factory workers, which says there's been a craze for growing red poppies in everyone's garden, and the people who live here take uh, juice made from it to ease their pains. So I think that that's very good advice to stick to, the kind of, to look at class as a differentiator, but I would say that there's still, opium is still native to Europe and very widely used at every register as far as I can tell. It's just called different stuff. Um, okay, I'll stop there. Okay, so let's open the floor for general Q&A. Um, yeah, I'll accept this, this is no register and I'm going to say this conversation here. It might just be an amusing coincidence, but uh, I was reading recently the, the practice of splenectomizing horses, which is to say removing the spleen from the horse, is attributed to the Turks as a way of making their horses more aggressive and articulated in the context of a discussion about whether the spleen is an upper or a downer. Yeah. And as an organ, and moreover, nestled inside a large conversation about whether opium is a good or a bad drug. I can send you the references, but that's that. I don't know, there's just something there about so you're attributing um, uppers to um, Turkish people to make them more aggressive, seems to yeah. you know, go beyond opium and yeah. And the sex thing, too, that's. I totally need to put that in there, because you're right, it's like, the, it's everywhere. Yeah. And it seems to be linked to this Turkish concept of, the Turks are just hitting the on all cylinders, you know? They're, <laughs> they're invading Vienna, they can hold their seed bomber, they take skins out of horses. There's a large sort of thing going on with Turks just being scary supermen in early morning Europe, I guess. All right, uh, Pamela. Um, thanks. everything out, which probably is true, I mean, you know, but, but I guess that 
you know, what is the prior history of fumigation, which is something that you didn't talk about at all, right? That, which was a perfectly, you know, it was a very widespread Eurasian practice of, um, you know, fumigating either for specific things or to, you know, change the air quality, the airs mm -hmm. of a place. And in fact, that's what this recipe seems to be um, influenced by, the use of rosemary, burning rosemary to change the airs. And in fact, this one you don't smoke, you inhale, you hold it in your head. Uh -huh. You don't draw it into your lungs. So it's very interesting in that way, that it's, you know, it is a medical practice of, you know, trying to, try to fix for um, uh, uh, healing uh, colds and rooms. Right. And um, so you hold it. You hold the smoke in your head. You draw it into your mouth and hold it in your head. So that's a, you know an interesting twist on just medical uses of any sort of you know healing uh, material, um, and whether it's about you know whether there might be more to smoking than just an experiment. Um, so, okay, so that was a very long um, digression. So back, so that's the experimental culture. Then in terms of the, um, the uh, policing of the state of drugs, or, you know, the alcohol drugs, um, I would say that in places like the United States, it was more about the medical establishment policing medical practitioners and, and themselves so that they would be taken seriously and not be seen as charlatans. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the history of medicine in, in the United States, it is a history of trying to be taken seriously as, you know, not as charlatans. And so we can <coughs> set up standards, we set up the American, um, you know, medical association, etc. So, um, so I think that there's a story to be told um, that's not just about power and state. Yeah, thank you. Those are both great. I think the, I think the second point first, completely agree. Um, but I think it kind of depends, this maybe is a weak answer, but it depends on how you define state, I guess. So in the case of the, the Portuguese, who I know best, it's really interesting because the physicians, almost all the elite physicians are in the Inquisition also. The familiares, or the lay members of the Inquisition. That's not quite the state, but it kind of is in 18th century Portugal. And they're also, usually the kind of course that you'd run if you're a successful physician is to be a king's physician. So again, you're in the royal household. Mm -hmm. And in the kind of world of an 18th century court, that's a pseudo-governmental function because you have, gov you, for instance, might have power over enforcing the, the state pharmacopoeia. Mm -hmm. So, and the US is an interesting point because I think it's not quite that rigid at all. Um, but I, sh I should look more into like the, uh, the history of these pharmacopoeias as, as, as well, uh, stated. London, the, yeah. the pharmacopoeia of London was set up by physicians, you know, trying guilt, to yeah. establish themselves as a college in order to police um, practitioners, yeah. you know, medical practitioners in the medical marketplace. Yeah. I guess I would say that's completely true, but I, I still see it as part of a larger state formation where it's kind of an institutionalization of authority, which is then linked to, for instance, I'm now the head surgeon of the British Navy, and that's sort of, you know, it's the same people occupying that, those roles. Um, but you're right, it's not exactly state, yeah, it's more just sure Sorry, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I mean, what implication that actually has for your larger argument? Yeah. Maybe it's not that relevant. Yeah. No, I'm still figuring that part out. Um, yeah, it's kind of the sort of thing where I was writing a book where I knew what the endpoint was, so I didn't talk about the endpoints, you know? I just knew that something happened to make drugs be enforced by the state, so now I just have to deal with it. Um, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> the fumigation completely true. This is, I remember you mentioning that when I gave a different yeah. talk, and it's like, it must be frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am too now, because I, I, um, I was in Iran this summer for a month, and literally every day that I was there, my mother-in-law took a, a little brazier and waved it around the house, and it was to get rid of the evil eye, and it contained rosemary, <laughs> as well as some other stuff. Um, like special evil eye mixture that you make, you know? And this is like, I agree, hugely common. It's such a, you know, multivalent thing, you know, because it's about the spirits and yeah. the invisible spirits and the, you know, the, 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 the
In the moment when it's done, like she would do it when people talked about dead people, but also when the house smelled bad, you know, it's just a magical thing. <laughs> I have trouble with that, with how to put that in, because I really do want to say that it's something different, in the sense that, well, even your pipe, like, I mean, taking it into your head as opposed to the lungs, that's still not the same thing as filling the room, right? It's much more individualized. I do think there's a difference there. But it may be better seen as a continuum than as a sharp break. Yeah, oh yeah, I agree, but it's just that there are a lot of nuances here, and yeah. the question is what kind of, what kind of a counter is right? Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I've been running into that a lot anyway. of yeah, communication. I don't know how to fit that in. I would love to hear from you if you have advice about how to make that work. Because if the whole chapter is just about smoke, it's like that's too, that's like a weird book rather than a chapter of a book. So I don't know how to make it totally straight in that way. Thank you for your question. Um, okay, so we have uh, six minutes left, and I have three people like on the list of questions. So I'm going to point to those people and let them all ask together, and uh, so we can end on time at 7.30. Okay. And you can answer what you want. So I have Matt. Um, yes, uh, lady here and the gentleman in the back. So, Matt, do you want to start off? I'll just make an L. Sure, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm equally fascinated by the image you showed of the Opium Warehouse. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more, if there's time, about the, uh, the refining and manufacturing of these perfectly uniform balls of opium and what their cultural balance is in their story. Okay. Uh, yes, a comment. Uh, the use of which of the works today lays claim to be uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the suggestion of the American. And um, um, likewise, you have lots of instances of self-experimentation that might be intriguing to emphasize. And finally, what about the controlled case of alcohol? In other words, was it compared to, used against, I mean, surely the drunkenness was ubiquitous in literature and all the rest, how does that fit in with the model? Um, and then my final comment is that um, those of us who have to survive with the FDA would consider the degrees of policing. Okay, the gentleman. Thank you. Um, are you familiar with the economic term Baptist bootleggers? No. Okay, so um, you might want to check out Mark Thornton's book, The Economics of Prohibition, that came out in 2014. So Bruce Yandel came out with this concept in about 1970, um, Baptists and Bootleggers. And then they explained a little bit as far as in Mark Thor Thornton's book, uh, which I read that it was material, the state formation and stuff. And I'm kind of curious as um, uh, knowing what I know about the drug trade as far as how it's done with prohibition and shadow governments. Do you see this as a way back in the day as far as going ahead and maybe being a flanking maneuver to set up a shadow government and to fund operations that you could not fund through regular taxation? Okay, Ben, so you have four minutes <laughs> for us to stay on time and about 20 questions to answer. So I'll let you decide how you want to spend your time and okay. then we'll thank you. <laughs> Um, well, again, working last to first, uh, I, that's a short one because I don't know anything about that, but th thank you for giving the references. I think prohibition is something I've completely ignored, and now that I'm getting up to that, you know, to me, a scary precipice of 1800, 1820, where I don't know anything suddenly, I need to definitely look at that. Thank you for that. Um, I hesitate to say shadow government in any sense in the, in the earlier period because everything is so disorganized. It's kind of like conspiracy theorists who just assume that everything functions. When in reality, in the 18th century, everything is just a total mess, so I don't think anyone's organized to do that. Um, which work make, makes morphine? That's like a tongue twister. Uh, I think it's the German. I know they still manufacture it. Um, and I know that cocaine, Merck cocaine, was like a huge boon to the company. If you read Keith Richards' autobiography, he's very effusive about Merck cocaine. <laughs> um, and it's still manufactured as a dentist, um, for, if for dentists. So, Merck is still doing it. It's actually, someone needs to write a book about this. Maybe they have, maybe in German, but it's really interesting that these pharmaceutical concerns go back so far. And another one I'll throw out is that methamphetamine was invented by a Japanese pharmacist in the 1880s. So these things go back way further than many people expect. Self-experimentation, totally. That's, um, the chapter before this is all about that, partially, so it sort of leads into this. Um, 
and then opium, the refining of opium balls. I honest, that's the easy one to answer too because I just don't know. I, 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 um, I think that probably has a lot to do. I want to. That's just guessing, but I want to say that it has to do with the East India Company needing a really discreet unit, as we saw with that image of the guy weighing it. It probably relates to like, here's a lump of lead and make the opium ball weigh that much, and that way we can get this much on a ship, and and really concretely documented. Um, it's, it would make sense that that was the origin of that exact format being so sticking around so long. Um, but I don't know, I don't really, I need to look more into the way these, these things are actually transported and stuff. Because I, I, you know, as you know from reading these medical texts, they don't say what the, like, maybe they mention that it comes from a goat's beard. I guess I'm not enough from the goat's beard. <laughs> but they don't say, like, what, how you harvest it from a goat's beard necessarily, or like, you know. It, or, or if they do give details, they're like really specific in a not useful way. Yeah. Well, the 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 like lactanum um, is it's not like, psychoactive mm -hmm. at all, um, but it is a sticky brown resin, and presumably the opium balls are also sticky yeah, brown. Yeah. I don't know if that's. And the, so is medicinal mummy actually. So there's something weird going on with this. <laughs> well, I need to look into the mummy thing too. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I feel like I need to look up the mummy thing in rosemary water after this. Well, talk. actually, this is relevant to the limbs. The the best way find out if you got the good mummy, and this is from a French apothecary, is if it's got a hand in it. <laughs> then you know it's a real mummy. Otherwise it just could be some weird resin. <laughs> so look for a hand. <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, thank you, Ben. Um, so if you could all join me in thanking Ben for coming.